fiber internet, crazy fast internet, powers this network, and our partners at Skuma Boutique Dispensary, Interstate Pest and Service Companies, Anderson Seafood and Catering, Cameron Limousine, and so many more that make the program possible. Folks, less than half an hour ago, breaking news in Charlottesville that is driving the news cycle. Um, Mayor Nakia Walker has chosen to withdraw her name from the 2021 Charlottesville City Council race. This is surprising news for many, expected news for some. Mayor Walker, if you watch the council meeting yesterday, it was volatile, bombastic, explosive, argumentative, Frankly, it was local government that I was disappointed to see. We have had a police chief that was terminated last week, surprising news by Chip Boyles, the city manager. The counselors on the dais, four of the five said they had no idea. One of them, the mayor, said this was a conspiracy, threatened allegations of, um, or threw out allegations of blackmail, threw out allegations of stabbing folks in the back. Just not a pretty sight. I would encourage everyone that's watching the show, and there are thousands watching, to please, at your convenience, jump over to the mayor's page and read what is a very long and somewhat discombobulated withdrawal announcement. Judah Wickhauer is our director. Judah, if you could go to the studio camera and then welcome this gentleman, David Toscano, to the program. David, when, when we scheduled this interview, I never anticipated news like this breaking. I'm excited to spotlight your book, um, something that you've done in partnership with the University of Virginia Press. Um, I think you will sell many, many copies of this book. Um, before we get to it, sir, first, good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's great to be back with you. And I'll tell you, you, very, very kind words. People have called me many things over the years. They, I don't think anyone has called me a Renaissance man. I'm going to put that on my, uh, on my Facebook page and give it to my family to remind them when I give them a hard time about other things. So thank you for the kind words. It's great to be back. It's great to have you. I believe it's his fourth rodeo on this network. This gentleman, um, a mayor at one time, a city councilor at one time, a state delegate at one time, an attorney, a family man, now a published author. How does it feel to be a published author? Well, you know, it feels great. And you know, I'm very proud of this work. I worked very hard on it. I had a lot of help with it. I had lots of talented people helping form my words in ways that I couldn't do. And uh, uh, I've learned a lot in the process. I, you know, you, when you have to put things on a piece of paper and document the things that you say, you learn a lot more. And uh, I learn every day, and that's part of great being alive is to learn every day. So I'm happy with this. We learned um, less than 40 minutes ago that Nakia Walker is withdrawn from this election. Your thoughts on this, sir? Well, I have a lot of really mixed feelings about it. You know, the, the problems of uh, racial d division in this community uh, were going to be there whether or not Mayor Walker continued to have her name on the ballot whether or not she won or lost the election, I think in some ways it's to the better part of valor because I don't think she would have won the election. I think that four years people four years ago, people were looking for a fresh face and they were looking to elect an African-American woman to council and they chose her. Uh, the Democrats have fielded two really uh, uh, quality, strong candidates and uh, I think the Democrats would have won the, the election handily. Of course, you know, who, who, who am I to say? But, you know, it, it does allow her to move away from her position without uh, the indignity of failing in a re-election campaign. Um, you know, I've read things over the years, and I, you know, so, a part of me sympathizes with the mayor. I've been there where she is. But the anger and the divisiveness with which she has, uh, you know, approached her position has not served the community well. And uh, 
hopefully this will give her some more peace in her own life uh, and perhaps help heal some of the uh, divisions that we have in this community. They're not, it's not going to be easy to do. It's going to take a lot of good-hearted people working and honestly sharing their views about things to get uh, constructive things done in the city. But we can do that, and uh, hopefully we will do that. Hopefully after this council election is completed and we get set with a new city council, they'll be able to work together more productively than it seems has been the case recently. This man's perspective incredibly valuable and experienced. He served on Charlottesville City Council from 1990 to 2002, 12 years on council. He served as mayor from 94 to 96. Then he parlayed a successful career as a politician in Charlottesville to the 57th district in the Virginia House of Delegates where he was the minority leader from 2011 to 2018. So you have the Richmond Times dispatch watching, um, the Daily Progress, all the TV stations in town. Um, have you seen the city that you love dearly, Charlottesville, in as much turmoil from a government standpoint as it is today? Well, you know, after the Unite the Right march, we were in really serious turmoil. Uh, I did not watch last night. I've been very dismayed at the, at the, 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 the these city council meetings and how they've uh, transpired, people yelling at each other, not respectful of each other. And what's really been troubling is that even the, some elected officials have not been respectful of the public or their colleagues. And that's really no way to run a democratic uh, government. People can disagree all the time, but you don't have to be uh, attributing evil or nefarious motives every time you turn around and every time you have a disagreement with someone. And I think there's too much of that going on. There are very strong feelings in this, in this community. There are very strong feelings in the country. But unless we get a hold of this notion of having some kind of a civil discourse, we can make it this country, we can destroy some of the very positive things that made this country so special. One of the um, essence of your book is local government state government, commonwealth government, has as big of an impact even more than, say, federal. Um, we're seeing that certainly here in Charlottesville. Um, I've been, and I'm choosing my words carefully, I've been very vocal on this network about the mayor, and I understand the reach and platform we have here. The poem that she published earlier this year um, left a very sour taste in my mouth. Um, from my standpoint, the mayor, which a position you've served, is the champion of the city. The individual man or woman who galvanizes us and tries to lead us into the direction um, positive for the community in totality and not just a section or a faction or a demographic of the voting population or citizenship. Your thoughts earlier this year on that poem, um, David? Well, again, you know, I understand some of the uh, feelings that the mayor may have had, but I t as mayor, you have a responsibility to project a good image of the city. That doesn't mean to say that gloss over it, all its problems, but figure out a way to talk about the problems as if they were a challenge that we could work on together to solve as opposed as a means of dividing us. And I think that's happening all over the country. It's happened here. That poem was very disturbing to me. I must admit there have been times when I was mayor where I really wanted to give a tongue lashing to people or I had a definite, very definite feelings about injustice. But I had to try to control myself because I had to also figure out a way to help motivate the city to do better. And I, I hope that we can return to that atmosphere among all the counselors, uh, try to support each other. Because, you know, there are five counselors, and they are all elected to hopefully do the best that they can. Uh, they're all elected, hopefully, with an open mind, so they can change their minds as things are presented to them. And I hope that they will find a way. You know, that, uh, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that there is so much gridlock 
and dissension in Washington that they really can't do very much of anything these days. And yet we are fascinated by Washington and we vote in national elections. What we don't do is focus energy on state and local government to the same extent. And so you see a drop off in participation in elections from federal elections to state elections and then to local elections. There's so much happening at the states right, in the states right now that not only control our lives and our kids' lives and our grandkids' lives, uh, you know, education being the classic example, less than 10% of all funding for education comes from the federal government. And all the curriculum decisions that are made are made at the state and local level, and yet we're not paying attention to those elections. But it's bigger than that, too, because it's not just about your or mine individual lives, it's also about the country. Because state legislatures control the rules for drawing districts for congressional races. They control the rules on who, how people can vote, what they have to present at the polls to vote, what the, what the time of the voting is, what kind of mobile sites, if any, you're gonna have. Uh, and you know, they, in that way, they can control the country and people are not paying attention to state legislatures. They think that Congress writes redistricts for Congress. That's not true. It's all done at the state legislative level, and we need to pay attention to it. We're going to highlight his book, and he makes a fantastic point. Um, C. D. McGill, Lloyd Snook, and Michael Payne each won a seat on the dais with less than 8,500 votes each. Michael Payne, in fact, 7,816 votes to win a spot on the dais. Heather Hill, 7,752. Mayor Walker, less than 8,000. So we're talking low engagement numbers here um, for folks that are determining quite a bit um, in towns and municipalities that we love. Let's highlight the, the flip book or the journey of publishing this book. Yeah. You journaled throughout your time in office. Put that in perspective for us. Well, when I first got down there, I started writing every, every day in a, in, a, in a notebook. And I have 14 of these notebooks with notes about what happened in Richmond during the time I was there. I wasn't able to write as much when I was leader because there was so much going on. But I, when I decided to retire from leadership, I said, well, well maybe I should try to write something. And, uh, I think I was telling you, uh, I began to write a book of my 25 years of experience in public affairs. And when I turned the book into the publisher, it was 1,200 pages. And they said, you can't publish anything this large. So I had to narrow the focus. And what came out was this book about states, variety of states, and what they're doing and what they're not doing. Everything from energy policy to policies on criminal justice to COVID and the pandemic. It, a lot of it is in here, and it just shows the richness of uh, different kinds of state, state policies, different kinds of state constitutions, different ways legislatures operate, the personalities that go into state government that make policy come alive. So hopefully people will get some insight on how things uh, change in Virginia or, frankly, all over the country. Daily Progress, um, watching the show, the Daily Press in Hampton Roads, the newspaper I grew up with. Um, I miss authors like um, David Teal and Norm Wood in the Daily Press, but welcome to the program newsroom at the Daily Press. Um, was it more challenging to serve on council in Charlottesville or the state legislator and why? Oh, much more challenging as a state legislator. As a state legislator, uh, I, in Charlottesville, all you need to do is count to three. If you get three votes, you can do just about anything. It's not as difficult to get three votes as it is to get seven votes in a committee, 51 votes on the House floor, have to take it over to the Senate, and then have to do it again in the same process. And then you've got a governor up there, and I had Republican governors that I served with as well, Bob McDonald was one, who might veto it even if I got it through that, the various processes. So it was a much greater challenge. Uh, and uh, we, I was in the major minority for the, all the time I was uh, in the General Assembly. And so you had to figure out a way 
to work with the majority to convince certain people that they should support whatever you were trying to do. So it was much more challenging. Give us some insight into how you convince, you persuade, you explain um, to those across the aisle, maybe on the same aisle as you, to get policy through or to get um, you know, the agenda through that you would like. How do you, because you're a charming guy. Oh, well. I don't know about that, but, you know, I, I do try to talk to people, which a lot of people don't, and, and I think that, that that hurts them. They think they got the greatest ideas in sliced bread, and they don't have to convince anybody. Well, you actually have to convince people to embrace your point of view. Now, there are certain things that I wouldn't be able to uh, uh, convince my Republican colleagues at the time. It didn't matter what I did. I mean, if there's something about gun safety legislation, something about reproductive rights. Uh, you know, there'd just be no way I could do that. But there were other things where the relationship did make a, a difference. I remember one of the first things that happened to me when I w went down there, Charlottesville wanted permission to do something. And in Virginia, as well as a number of other states, the states kind of preempt the local government from doing things that they're not specifically authorized to do. And when the, when the locality wants to do something, they go to their legislator and say, will you get enabling legislation passed that will enable us to do this? So I was working on something related to affordable housing, and I had to go through the housing committee. And one of the people on the housing committee was a guy named Bob Marshall, who was one of the most conservative members of the House of Delegates. And uh, even billed himself as the chief homophobe among the delegates. So that tells you exactly how strong he felt about conservative ideas. He looked at Charlottesville as the People's Republic of Charlottesville, made all kinds of disparaging comments. But I had to go through him to get this thing passed. So I went and sat in his office, and I just spent some time with him. And he said, okay, David, this is for your community. You represent your community. I'm going to support the bill. See, I'm not so bad after all. And that told me a couple things. One is, you should go talk to people with whom you disagree. Two is, they're also interested in building relationships. And ultimately, that's how you get things done in politics, relationships. You can exert power, but relationships help build that power. And a lot of things get done just simply because of the personalities involved. Did you get to a point in your political career where you were so burnt out that you considered quitting? And, and if you got to that point, how do you overcome that hurdle? Yeah, there were a number of times when I just thought, well, it was, it was time to go. And I think that uh, as we got closer to the majority, uh, I had a couple of goals. One, I wanted to make sure that the redistricting plan that the Republicans passed in 2011 was overturned. That happened in 2018 with the decision of, uh, of the court. Uh, so we had a new, new districts drawn, which led us to get the majority in 2019. Secondly, I wanted Medicaid expansion passed that would ensure some 4, 400,000 Virginians. That was passed in 2017. And um, the other thing I wanted to do is make sure that new members coming in in the wave election of 2017 Get, got acclimated to the General Assembly process. Once those three things were done, I was pretty much ready to go. Before that time, you know, I felt occasionally like I was just beating my head against the wall, but I did see some things that I thought we could do, and I wasn't going to leave until those certain things that I just mentioned got done. Uh, and you just have to marshal the courage and the fortitude to stick with it, and that's what I did. Why don't we um, take some questions and comments from the viewers and the listeners. Um, if you have a comment, a question for David Toscano, please put them in the feed. Um, you can purchase his book through upress.virginia.edu, guys. Um, and we'll get to his book in a matter of moments. Uh, Bill, One more thing. Sure. Local <coughs> businesses, too. I think, uh, I don't know if Barnes & Noble got theirs, but New Dominion has signed copies of my on book. On the downtown mall. On the downtown mall right now. Julia will appreciate the shout out. The book sizzles. So get there and buy the book. Um, questions coming in. So Bill McChenzie says hello to you. Yeah, says, it's great, great to see you. you. Um, this question is coming from Fredericksburg. 
okay. for you. Um, this question is for uh, your guest, David Toscano Jerry. Please ask him about the need for multiple parties on ballots. In Charlottesville, for example, which is a town that, that I love, it seems the Democrats have a strong hold on the city. Can your guest speak to competition and multiple parties and what it could do for various cities? Well, you know, I agree. I wouldn't necessarily put it in, as multiple parties, but certainly multiple perspectives. I, I think that one of the problems that we're seeing across the country is the nationalization of state and local politics, where people make decisions on who they're going to vote for based on the tribe they're from, and that tribe identity is coming from the national politics. So that it, it used to be <coughs> that people might vote Republican in the presidential, but they might vote Democratic in the state, and they might vote different for the delegate, and they might vote different for the local person. And they would look at the, what these people stood for. And that is increasingly not the case. If people are you know, voting on the basis of the tribal identity. Another party doesn't necessarily solve that. What solves that is many different new ideas and the best place where that can happen is at the local and at the state level. The folks who run for Charlottesville City Council are not gonna face issues really that are quote Democratic or Republican. Now occasionally there will be some, but generally it's like, well, how do you put together a budget that serves the needs of the people in the community? How much money do you put in the police department? Is that a Democratic or a Republican issue? Uh, how much money do you put into the public works department to make sure that your, your streets don't have cracks in them? What kind of money do you put in public transit? Those things don't really sort out as Democratic or Republican. But unfortunately, people often make the decision on voting based on whether there's a D or an R at the end of the name. And that won't be affected by multiple parties, I don't think. This is an interesting comment coming in from Richmond. Um, Jerry, please ask a delicate Toscano um, how social media has impacted the political landscape. Both good and bad. Uh, one of the things great about social media is, is you can be in touch with lots of people in lots of different ways. Uh, but the, the, the thing is bad about it is that a lot of times you don't have the real engagement that you need to have in order to really understand where people are coming from. There's too much, there's too much of shouting and, and posting of things that can be you know, very hurtful to people and shut down conversation. I don't think social media is going away, so I think we gotta find ways to encourage people to be more responsible in how they use it. Uh, and part of that's gonna have to come back to how people see themselves as citizens in this great country of ours. Uh, and part of our role as leaders is to encourage that citizenship. And let me give you an example. Now, I don't know what the caller thinks about who won the national election, but Joe Biden won the national election, and all the studies indicate there's very little fraud. But yet there still is this thing called the big lie out there that suggests that Donald Trump won the election. Now, I can say that all uh, again and again and again on social media, that this is the big lie, this is the big lie. But my Republican colleagues, most of whom know that Joe Biden won the election and Donald Trump did not, have to step up and say to people who come to them with the big lie and just say, you know, I'm sorry, there wasn't that kind of fraud and Donald Trump lost. I disagree with Joe Biden, but Donald Trump lost. Let's go to the next election. And until people start saying that, you know, we're going to have a problem. Uh, just compare it by comparison. I think the Russians tried to intervene in the Trump-Clinton Trump election. I don't know if it made the difference in the election, but I've never questioned the legitimacy of the election itself, even though I really despise most all of what Trump stood for. And I said, you know, we've got to say grace on that election. We've got to fight another day. That's what democracy is about. 
and we'll go forward. And I was willing to tell people who came to me and said, the Russian fix, Russians fixed it all. And I was able, I, I said to them, look, it's not the case. That we know that they did things, but we don't know that it made the difference. So let's move on to the next election. Republicans got to say the same thing. How have you seen, I'll try to put this in perspective. My first job out of UVA was at the Daily Progress as a staff writer. And I had the pleasure of sitting fairly closely to a journalistic institution by the name of Bob Gibson. Sure enough. Bob Gibson, one of the most talented journalists I've ever been around, mm -hmm. covered politics um, better than most. Um, I still try to keep up in touch with Bob from time to time. The unfortunate thing of journalism today is the field, the industry, the category is being eroded by big business. Big business that's more concerned about their bottom line, their balance sheets, their stocks, their cash positions, and they're letting go pink slipping their journalists in favor for talent that's fresh out of college, basically what I was, that was willing to work for 10 bucks an hour, basically what I did when I took that job. Mm -hmm. How has the minimalization of journalism impacted politics? In a lot of ways, the journalists were the watchdogs. Yeah, a tremendous impact. I think that's one of the major reasons why we have such polarization in the country right now. Uh, and I can just speak from personal experience. When I first went to Richmond in 2006, there must have been 20 reporters that were attached to the Daily Press, the, the Richmond Times Dispatch, uh, Winchester Star, uh, for, uh, Re uh, Fredericksburg free, Freelance uh, Star. Star. Uh, and they were from all Roanoke Times. They're all there, and they stayed there throughout the entire session. And now it's hard to determine whether there are three or four that actually cover the session. What happens in that environment is that it's all social media stuff that's put out by the parties, by the individuals, and it, it doesn't have an objectivity to it. You know, I tried to be objective as I could when I was leader, but I was trying to sell something too. It wasn't, you know, just not on the one hand, on the other hand kind of thing. And so when you pull away the, the re reporting on state issues, what are you left with? The national. And then we focus on Rachel Maddow versus Fox, right? That pulls us apart. And it encourages this tribal mentality where the decisions about state politics are made based on your allegiance to the Democratic or the Republican Party. I think that's what, what what's affected uh, state houses around the country. It's going on all over the place. The good news is there are some efforts to restore civic journalism. States, uh, states Newsroom, for example, has a whole set of reporters in different places around the country and state house. Politico has this interesting feature where they report every day on state issues. There's a Florida section, a New York session, Illinois, California. So there are efforts to rebuild the state reporting, and I hope they continue because I think they're good for democracy. This is an interesting comment from uh, Christopher, who's watching in Belmont. Belmont, for those that are watching across the Commonwealth, and I see three um, states that are watching David Toscano on today's show. Uh, we'll welcome our friends from North Carolina, um, our friends from Tennessee, Virginia, and West Virginia on the show. Um, Christopher asked this, David, would you consider running again for Charlottesville Council and offering some stability for all of us? You know, probably not. I mean, I spent 12 years, and uh, it's hard to know whether, you know, it, 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 there just comes a time you need a new generation of leadership. And uh, I'm glad to offer my two cents to whoever wants to listen, but being in the trenches and, uh, you know, summoning the energy, and there's incredible energy that's needed, probably is left better to somebody who has, uh, is a little younger than I am. What are the day-to-day -day trenches like? Oh, just constant phone calls. I, I mean, local government is uh, it's more demanding in some ways than state government. I mean, uh, 14 years in the General Assembly, a lot of people thought that I went to work in Washington every day. I mean, it was very cute that they did, but it wasn't the case. And I didn't get as many phone calls as a delegate. 
as I did uh, when I was in local government. Then again, I didn't have to raise the kind of money as in local government as you had to raise in state government, especially when you were a leader. So, um, you know, the demands are constant in local government. I think that it's even more demanding now because of social media firing away at you, uh, tagging you on, on Twitter and whatever, they, uh, whatever folks do to try to reach you. Um, but it's uh, for a younger person right now. Uh, Laura Mulligan Thomas watching the program. Welcome to the show, folks in Norfolk, Virginia. Welcome to the program. We're talking with... Um, Retired Delegate David Toscano here on today's show. Here's an interesting comment, um, and this is coming from Jennifer. Jennifer is watching. Jennifer, please let us know where you're watching. I believe it's somewhere here in the city. In fact, this is a comment also coming in from Bill McChenzie. So both Jennifer and Bill have similar comments. Um, any thoughts or perspective that you could offer to the upzoning conversation that's happening oh. in the city of Charlottesville? I lo I've got lots of concerns about the upzoning. I've got I, and, and again, to give you some perspective, when I was on council, we were in the process of doing a, a, a new comprehensive plan that involved more density in residential neighborhoods. It was exactly this kind of issue. It was involved what's called R1A, the creation of an R1A zone. And so uh, one of the things I learned in that process is that Process, process, process. You have to take your time. I think one of the concerns that people have is that uh, they think it's being rammed down people's throats. I don't think it's really that. I think that people have been consumed with the pandemic, with COVID, and they haven't been able to pay as much attention. But be that as it may, this is a big change for the city. You need to make sure you get it right. And some of the arguments that I hear about density inevitably creating affordable housing, I just don't think pass muster in terms of studies of other communities. So I think people just need to take their time. I think a certain amount of greater density makes more sense for a city like ours, but why just put it in one neighborhood and versus another? All, all neighborhoods have a response to density. You know, generally speaking, people don't like it. It's sort of not in my backyard. But density coupled with design can make a huge difference in people's perception of their neighborhood. So I think they just need to take their time. Uh, I'm not as conversant with all the details. Uh, I know that my neighborhood, for example, was targeted for upzoning. And it just doesn't make any sense economically in my neighborhood. Um, and I think they just need to take their time. Take a step back, listen to people. I listened to the Planning Commission uh, public hearing, and it seems though almost no one spoke in favor of the plan that was being advanced. So take their time, step back, do the right thing. Michael Arlen, welcome to the program, and thank you for sharing the show. Ray Cadell says, this is a great guy you have on the program. Ray Cadell, Big Ray and the Cool Cats, thank you for watching um, today's program. Siva Weekly, welcome to the broadcast. I'll throw this to you. Um, in fact, why don't I get to more questions that are coming in? You're a popular guy here. Um, Kevin Higgins says, what advice would you give city council right now, David? Try to be supportive of each other. I mean, even with all that's going on, you try to be supportive of each other. You don't throw the other person under the bus. You respect their point of view. You can say you disagree, but you respect their point of view. Everybody, you know, they develop their points of view based on their background. Some points of view are crazy, others are not. You try to find ways to learn from each other. So, uh, and you know, they, I've noticed they've been pretty judicious in their commenting about the police chief firing. Well, That's four very, of them didn't even talk about it. Yeah, I mean, you, you can only say so much about a personnel action because it's a, she's a person and she has certain rights to her privacy. Who knows exactly what went on? It's, it's clear she had lost the faith of at least a majority of the council and it manifested itself in, in her firing. But you need to be respectful of a person's uh, privacy. And uh, you know maybe she'll want to reveal things about it, I don't know. But I think they've been pretty good in responding to that. Everybody demands to know why. 
But there might be a very uh, you know, complex set of reasons why that we don't want to talk about because of respect for her. You were the mayor of Charlottesville from 94 to 96. You have perspective that's valuable. Do we think this jurisdiction is best served in a strong mayor type of government? I, I, don't, I don't think it really makes... I, I like the idea that everybody is elected at large because everybody has to respond to every neighborhood, and you're a small enough community. You have to pick the mayor, though, I think. The mayor is the first among equals, but the mayor also should have special qualities that allow them to serve in a way that's productive, uh, that supports the city and encourages people to all be engaged in how we make policy choices. So it requires somebody who can reach out to the other counselors, talk to the other counselors all the time, try to make sure he or she understands what the counselors are thinking, try to build a consensus. I mean, I talked a little bit ago about getting three votes, but really in local government, you should try to reach consensus if you can. If you can't, you take a vote, and the vote stands for what it stands for. But it's a small enough community. We ought to be, have more people involved, and we ought to try to find ways to reach consensus as opposed to just try to have a vote that forces an issue uh, just on a bare, simple majority of one. Nicholas Erpe, welcome to the show. Vanessa Parkhill, thank you for joining us on the program. Shore Pump, Virginia, welcome to the show. Um, this question comes from LinkedIn. Is Charlottesville best served in a ward system? I, I don't think so. I think you get too much parochialism in a ward system, and then you get trade-offs and horse trading that isn't necessarily productive. Now, the county has a magisterial district system, uh, and they've been pretty good at trying to, to support each other uh, in, in the decision-making process and look for ways to work together. And that was true whether there was a, there was a Democratic majority or a Republican majority on the county board. Uh, I, I think, I like the idea of having to appeal to people across the city. Uh, maybe call me old-fashioned, but I like the idea of having to appeal to 40 to 50,000 people as opposed to appealing to only 10,000 and you get elected with a very, very small number of people behind you, and you can't figure out how to work with other people who come from a different perspective. Interesting questions come in here. And guys, um, put the questions in the feed. I will relay them on air. This is from Twitter. We'll welcome Carol Thorpe to the broadcast, um, WINA to the broadcast. Thank you guys for joining us here with David Toscano. Um, Here's an interesting question from Twitter. Um, Delegate Toscano, why do you think the uh, Democratic Party um, has such a strong grip on not only Charlottesville, but also Albemarle County? Well, it didn't used to have a very strong grip on Albemarle County. And I, I think in terms of Albemarle, I think the Democrats have fielded very, very strong candidates. And the issues that they've spoken to have resonated more strongly with the public. I think that's why. I mean, every single person who's run on the Democratic ticket in the last decade, has, their number one uh, issue was education. And that was the number one issue for people in Almaro County. Number two was preservation and conservation, environmental issues. Uh, and that's very big in, in Almaro County. The tax... Uh, taxing question, <clears throat> you know, they, it, it used to be that you'd get elected in Elmore County by saying no new taxes. A lot of people in more rural areas are justifiably concerned, well, everybody's justifiably concerned about taxation, but that's a more salient issue in the rural area of Elmore County, where they're sur they don't get as many services as in, the, as in the urban ring. But you don't see it as pronounced in the county as a whole, so it's tended to go blue. Charlottesville uh, really turned blue, I guess, with my election in 1990 because I, I upended a very popular Republican, a gentleman named Darden Tao, who, was, who used to play Santa Claus around here. So you know how popular he was, and I just beat him on the basis of shoe leather. But after that election, the Democrat, demographics of the city, which had been changing, changed to the point 
where it was going to be difficult for a Republican who just campaigned on no new taxes and cut the budget to win. There were too many needs and too much support for public education, and Democrats have, uh, relied on that to win various seats over the years. The revenue sharing agreement oh boy. between the city and the county, yeah. I get this all the time, and we yeah. are getting this now. This predated your time on council yeah. by, I believe, eight years. I think it was 1982. Right. The revenue sharing agreement was signed. You first served on council in 1990. Right. Anywhere you want to go on the revenue sharing agreement, it's an agreement that continues to be on the tip of people's tongues. And people in the county are, you know, they, I understand why they might be concerned because they know that some money is being transferred from Elmarle County to the city of Charlottesville every year. It's done by a formula, it's done by an agreement, and Charlottesville gave up the right to annex portions of the county with that agreement. If Charlottesville had not come to that agreement with Albemarle at that time, a lot of the land between Ryle Road and, uh, and Hydraulic would be in the city today with all that tax revenue flowing into the city. It's a huge base. A huge tax base, in fact, the major tax base of the county. So it has worked for the county, too, in the sense that they haven't had to, uh, uh, that those taxes would not be gone from the county because of Charlottesville and the annex. The other thing I might say is that uh, it's supposed to be used for capital improvements in the city. And if I have one criticism of the city councils, I, my criticism would be that they haven't always used the money for capital improvements. They've often used the money for operating expenses, which I don't think was really the reason why revenue sharing was adopted. I think the purpose was that Charlottesville would get the money, they would, they would invest it in public infrastructure that would benefit the city and the county, but it hasn't always been that way. Some of the money is being used for that, but not all of it. The role of the University of Virginia in Charlottesville and Almaro County. I mean, we say all the time on this network, it's not the city of Charlottesville, it's the city of UVA. Um, right. UVA is this municipality, is Almaro County. Right. What is UVA's role? Well, it's the major economic driver of the community. I was on a forum a couple, couple years ago, and one of the people on the forum who's been, it was very critical of the city, very critical, of the univer very critical about everything, made some comment about, you know, uh, the university was the plantation. And, you know, I understand there's a history of racism that was at that university and a lot of discrimination. The lawn was built with enslaved laborers. I, I get that, I get all the history. But without the University of Virginia, we look like a small town in rural Virginia. We don't look like we do today. We wouldn't be like we are today. We wouldn't be as cosmopolitan. We wouldn't have the arts. We wouldn't have the music. We wouldn't have the activity in lots of different parts of the community. We wouldn't have the economic base that pays people a living wage for everything from plumbing to administrative work. You know, we wouldn't have that. And so uh, we have to make sure that we hold the university to account for things that they do that affect our community negatively but we also have to celebrate the fact that they're here and the ways that they affect us positively. It's sort of almost like a revenue sharing transfer from all the kids from Northern Virginia who come to, to UVA and bring their money and they transfer it into this community and help us. And I, I think that's, it makes us part, makes us who we are. Um, more comments coming in for you. Um, we are at the 45 minute marker. Can we spend a couple more minutes with sure. you? Sure, I guess maybe I'm being provocative. I guess that's good. You're, it is good. You're doing a heck of a job here. Um, this comment is coming in from Mark McKinney. Um, Mark McKinney um, is Mr. Crozet. He serves on the uh, Community Advisory Committee okay. in Crozet. Um, and he's got a good question for you. He says, with the recent termination of the police chief and the perception of turmoil and leadership since Longo retired, what are the next steps, Delegate Toscano? Crime is getting worse um, in Charlottesville. There are increased shootings in the city. There's low morale within the department and the appearance of turmoil between the police and local government. Um, can you expand this question um, or your answer to maybe the city manager level? Um, it seems to be a revolving door with positions in City Hall. How does government get back on track? Well, first, 
you know, it's easy for me to, to make commentary about what's going on in City Hall. I'm not there. I don't want to say I really know. I mean, my, my perception is very much like a citizen that lives in my neighborhood might have a perception. So, but I'll tell you my view, based a little bit on my experience, is that you, you need a new, new leadership in the police department to restore that, that morale uh, and make sure that the police are doing their, their jobs. Now, you also need leadership at the council level to support the police in doing their jobs, and you need leadership within the department to make sure that they don't go overboard in doing their jobs in a racially discriminatory fashion because that's one of the big issues out there right now. So it's all about leadership, and how that unfolds will be really the role of the city manager working with the council. Now, the, the, the police chief reports to the city manager. The city manager hires the police chief and fires the police chief, not the mayor. Now, sometimes we forget that. Some people think the mayor should do this. But as important as a hire as this one will be, you've got to believe that city council is going to be in the middle of this and making recommendations to the city manager. At least that's what would happen when we, I helped hire Tim Longo. And I'll never forget the first time he sat down and the first thing out of his mouth was, I believe in the Constitution and I believe in people's rights. And I said, oh my golly, this is, he's going after the police chief's job. I was sold almost immediately and we hired him. And that was at a time when morale was pretty bad in the police department. Now, I think it was, it was a lot better when Tim was there and has, has suffered a lot since that time and it just has to be rebuilt. What are your thoughts on the defund the police movement? Uh, it's a crazy slogan and it doesn't make very much sense. I think if you look behind the slogan and you ask yourself why, people are saying, look, we have to reimagine how police do their work because it hasn't been working. We've got too many people who've been shot on the streets we have too many people's rights who've been violated and police being put in harm's way as a result. So you have to step back and you have to say, how are we gonna do this differently? But I can tell you, the 80-year-old African-American woman who lives in Fifeville, when she calls 911, she wants the police to be there. That's why defunding the police makes very little political or practical sense. Gene Jensen, watching the program, former Secretary, Secretary um, State Board of Elections. Right. Toscano is reasonable and thoughtful. That's nice. I always found the same for her. So mutual admiration society. That's nice. Thank you. Your legacy, David. Have you thought about that? Uh, I, I, uh, I think about that occasionally. But I mean, I, I look at the things we got done when I was in the General Assembly Again, Medicaid expansion for 400,000 uh, Virginians, uh, changing uh, the way, uh, changing the redistricting plan for 2011 so Democrats could get to, to the majority. The things we've done on felon rights in voting and the major legislation on both voting and energy that passed the General Assembly is a result of Democratic control. Uh, we have one of the first pre-clearance arrangements in the country designed to combat against racially discriminatory voting procedures at local levels. Now, that's a place where the state has a proper role to play to make sure that if you live in Dillwyn, you can vote, you get access to the polls, and nobody in local government is going to prevent you from getting access. Uh, the same thing with Roanoke or any other part of the of the Commonwealth. So, I'm very proud of the things we did there. Uh, and beyond that, I hope people will say that when I was leader, I tried to approach things in a in a civil fashion, not backing down from my point of view, but pr trying to present it in a way that was respectful of others. Uh, because I hope we can do more of that in the future. This question is from Spencer, who's watching in McLean. Virginia. Um, Jerry, please add, ask Delegate Toscano if local government, government at the state level and at the federal level is better served for all of us with a stronger third party option. 
I, I, I think I tried to answer that before. I don't think it is so much the party itself, but the different ideas that are involved. I think it's very, very difficult to build a third party. Uh, and we've seen various efforts. Most recently, the Libertarian Party has probably the most, been the most effective. But even their statewide uh, candidate for governor didn't get much traction. Not in much the end. traction, yeah. And so, you know, for people who want change, unfortunately, I think for for them who are who don't like the Democrats or the Republicans, they're sort of stuck working with that party. I, one of your callers I know was active in the Tea Party movement, and I think she probably has uh, she has lots of concerns with the Republican Party. Is that Carol least. Thorpe? I, I'm not mentioning names, okay, okay. but I mean, she's a very earnest person who very feels very strongly about her point of view. She may not like certain things the Republicans do, but she has come, I think, has come to believe that that's the only game in town for her. And you've got the Bernie bros, too. I mean, you've got Democratic Socialists who might want a Socialist Party, but they don't, it's not going anywhere, really. So they're trying to work in the Democratic Party. And so that's the, the whole panoply of issues and interests that find their way into parties and you sort them out within the party structure itself. Your thoughts on the governor's race. McCulloch, a heavy favorite. Does Youngkin have a chance? Well, he always has a chance. I mean, uh, out of the last 17, I think, statewide elections in Virginia, uh, Democrats have won 12 of them. They've won three Democratic uh, presidential campaigns since 2008. The state is definitely trending Democratic. Uh, Northern won the state by nine percentage points back uh, in 2017. But it's still, it's, it's, it's a purplish state with a blue hue, and anything can happen. And uh, Terry McAuliffe would tell you that. You know, Terry McAuliffe, I'm a good friend of Terry McAuliffe's. You know, he grew up in Syracuse just like me, a mile from my house. I've known him for ages. I don't know Glenn Youngkin. He, I, he's probably a very nice man. I don't know. but So I'm a big supporter of Terry McAuliffe, but I think it's going to be a close race. And more importantly, all these Democratic, uh, all these delegate races down ballot are going to be very close. The, the Democrats have a 55-45 uh, margin in the House of Delegates. Who knows what that's going to look like after election eve. I think they probably will keep the majority but it's all going to be a question of who shows up. Governor Ralph Northrum's tenure and term. Your thoughts? I mean, I think he, I mean, perhaps, he may be perhaps one of the most consequential governors in Virginia history. What I do mean, you mean by that? Well, when you think of what he came back from, and you think of all the changes that have been made, when I got to the generals only in 2006, I was opponent of the death penalty. There were 12 people with me on that point. Every year, the Republicans would put in a bill that would expand the crimes for, with, for which the death penalty, uh, were death penalty eligible. I would vote against them, but you know, 11 or 12 people. This year, the death penalty in Virginia was repealed. That's a huge change. But that's not all. Northern had Medicaid expansion, the Voting Rights Act, the energy bill, uh, increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, a whole host of changes that have been made. All of the efforts on rec racial reconciliation that he's made. And, and you look at that record and you have to say, wow, it's an incredible record. Uh, of, uh, of consequential change. I think that's what he'll be remembered for. You're a tremendous interview, sir. Um, extremely insightful. I'm going to ask you here in a matter of moments um, where we can buy the book, how we can buy the book. Um, Alan Paulson is um, giving you some props on today's show. One question for me um, personally. What advice would you give um, someone like me who'd like to get actively involved in local politics. Listen, 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 and go to places that you never thought you would go. Whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's an African-American church or whether it's a, a pancake supper at some local fire department. Just get around and know people and get to, to, to understand what they think about things because sometimes you'd be surprised. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and ask lots of questions. So, 
Where can we get this beautiful book? Well, uh, UVA Press has a, a website. You can get it on that. You can go on my website and then click on UVA Press. So that's one place. New we Dominion. want you to hold it up and we can yeah, get it on, sure. on screen. Okay, look at this beautiful cover forward by Senator Mark Warner. Very nice. So, yeah. oh, this, yeah, okay. Uh, you can get it at New Dominion uh, downtown. I imagine it's going to be in the Barton Noble. Uh, and, of course, you can get it on Amazon, but I like to support our local support businesses. Support local. And you get a signed copy at New Dominion because I went down and signed a bunch of books today. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for the time. I would love to do um, some more interviews with you. The second book. Why don't we highlight the second book? We'll do that when that comes out. When's the release? Do we... We don't have a definite release date. I think it'll be sometime January or February 2022. Okay. Thank you for the time today. Sure. Thank you. David Toscano, boys and girls. The interview, for those that are asking, will be archived in totality on ilovesevil.com. It's published on every social media platform known to man. For those that are listening on Spotify, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts, if you'd like more information on the book, um, you can go to David Toscano's website. And you can buy it through there, or you can come to the downtown mall in Charlottesville if you're local and buy it from New Dominion Bookstore. Tomorrow's program is also going to be impactful. We have Yaz Washington running for Charlottesville City Council on set. There were four. Now there are three running for City Council. Yaz Washington, Brian Pinkston, and Juan Diego Wade. This is the I Love Seville show where we bring content to you and the places you are, your smartphone. Thank you for joining us on the Wednesday edition of the program. Take care. You were fantastic. Great, thank you. Thank you. Now, take a little bit about the backstory.